interest you. Our next presentation deals with driving e-commerce performance by Keith Anderson of Profit Hero. First, some housekeeping uh, items. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box in the lower left of your screen. We'll answer them along the way as time allows. Uh, this conference is being recorded. Attendees will be sent links to recordings and presentations and other materials early next week. Now, between after this presentation and before the next one, there will be a CPG and retail trivia quiz for valuable prizes, including the grand prize of a Kindle Fire HD. So stand by after this presentation. Again, the next presentation deals with driving e-commerce performance. Joining me now is Keith Anderson, Vice President of Strategy for Profitero, a leading global provider of e-commerce intelligence for retailers and brands. Keith, take it away. John, thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon to some of you. I see we've got some people listening in from across the pond, so really great to be with everyone. And uh, I think uh, some of you I already recognize, but if it's the first time that you're hearing from me or Profit Zero, uh, as John said, we are uh, a global provider of e-commerce intelligence for both retailers and brands. We work with companies like uh, Walmart and Sam's Club as well as leading manufacturers like L'Oreal and Etsy Johnson. And I lead product strategy and the team of analysts that supports our customers doing essentially what we're going to talk about today, which is using not only data but insight and intelligence to accelerate your performance in the e-commerce channel. And I'm, I'm sure as you hear from others presenting today, uh, it will be really, really clear why this is such a timely topic uh, because while it's certainly the case that e-commerce represents a relatively small percentage of the overall grocery and CPG business today, uh, there is growing momentum, and in my view, we're truly at an inflection point. Uh, according to IRI, with whom we just presented a few weeks ago at their summit, uh, within the next five years or so, somewhere between a third to as much as half of the total CPG growth between 2015 and 22 will come from e-commerce. And they're bracing the industry to plan for a 1-5-10 scenario over the next five to eight years. That is, we're going to go from today where just 1% of the CPG industry is sold online to a landscape where within around three years, 5% of CPG sales are sold online, to within the seven to 10 year horizon, as much as 10% of CPG sales could be sold online. And what I often tell folks is that not only is the volume growth accelerating online, but there's immense influence that the online channel has over offline retailing. And Deloitte estimates that as of September 2014, 33% of grocery sales in the U.S. are already digitally influenced. So not only does your sales performance in the online channel really have profound implications to your growth trajectory over the next several years, but it has big implications for the way your brand equity is built or protected and influences your performance offline. And I think a lot of folks look back at the last decade or more of uh, uh, online grocery experimentation and the relatively slow build that we've seen historically and say, you know, I think it, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of people talking about things, but I don't know that it's really going to happen. And I would tell you from our position as uh, not only observers, but very closely working with both retailers and manufacturers in this space, uh, it's, it's a growing priority for retailers in every segment of the market. That is, traditional e-commerce players like Amazon have demonstrated a profound commitment to uh, CPG products and grocery products through programs like Amazon Prime Pantry, which is oriented to, to shelf-stable and ambient products, uh, as well as programs like Amazon Fresh which is expanding to more and more metro areas and fulfills complete baskets of not only shelf-stable but temperature-sensitive products as well. 
And I'm sure everybody appreciates that some of our largest existing retail partners, Walmart, Target, uh, Ahold and its Peapod division, and Kroger are all making major investments in e-commerce. Walmart recently underwent a replatforming exercise, and they've been expanding their full basket grocery delivery model in markets like Colorado, California, Arkansas, and others, Arizona. Uh, Target is quietly enhancing its online grocery capabilities and has made a huge effort to work with suppliers to enhance and enrich the product content, even for products that are only available in store. And Kroger, as I'm sure everyone knows, owns the Harris Teeter chain that was one of the pioneers in the U.S. of the click and collect model that's so dominant in globally mature markets like France and increasingly the U.K., Uh, And they last year acquired an online pure play retailer focused on uh, health and wellness products. So there's no question that even among our most established, most strategic customers, there's an immense focus on e-commerce, and it's becoming increasingly key to the way that we plan our business with them. And thirdly, uh, there are some relatively high-profile new entrants to the market. I think uh, many of you may have heard of Instacart, which is valued now at north of $2 billion. It's a very well-capitalized venture-backed company uh, that's growing double digits week over week in some markets. And Instacart serves as a marketplace that sits on top of brick-and-mortar retailers uh, entirely in the grocery sector. And it's a a very underreported, I think, uh, understudied, player in the U.S. landscape because it's non-traditional. That is, the suppliers, we don't engage with Instacart directly, so we may not be sure what to do about it. But I can tell you, it really is lighting up awareness and adoption of online grocery in the U.S. at the moment. Uh, And then secondly, there's another new entrant called Jet, you may have heard of, founded by Mark Lohr, who uh, previously founded the Quidzy sites like Soap.com and Diapers.com. Uh, This is another new marketplace, uh, not oriented towards temperature-sensitive products, but very clearly positioned as a competitor to Amazon and really, in our view, validates the demand for grocery and CPG products. And you have yet more new entrants like Fox, which is a mobile-first, in fact, mobile-only online peer player that really positions versus the warehouse club players, Costco and Sam's Club, but without the membership fees. So all of this is simply to say that while it may feel like online grocery hasn't uh, established itself as a truly mature channel, and and I would say it really is day one in that sense, uh, there is so much accelerating investment and adoption from consumers that it's becoming increasingly key for manufacturers to understand where they're starting from, and really focus on how they appear and perform in the channel. And so that's why I I wanted to share with you today a little bit of uh, a a framework and a process for how to think about insight and analytics in the channel and really how to maximize your performance online uh, from a sales perspective, but equally from an online presence and offline influence perspective. And I can tell you that across the industry, uh, somewhere between half and two-thirds of the industry has some sense of where they stand in the online channel. But they're often doing that manually uh, with a lot of distributed effort across people that are uh, overtaxed and overburdened because in addition to e-commerce, they might be managing other customers or other distribution channels. Uh, But it's essential to do that initial assessment to show you where you're in distribution, where your products are placed in key parts of an online retailer site, uh, and some of the fundamentals that we'll discuss as we go through our time together today. Uh, And at Profitero, we work with our customers really efficiently, typically within about six weeks, to give them a sense for where they're starting from. And once you know where you're starting from, you need to focus on continuous improvement. 
And that simply means defining some targets for improving your performance and then measuring that performance and ultimately uh, recalibrating as time goes on. And in that sense, we think it's essential that you really understand where you're positioned versus competition and where you're positioned versus companies that are outperforming or brands that are outperforming. Uh, and the destination for all of this, in our view, is just as in the offline landscape, where the discipline of category management and retailer supplier collaboration is really mature and established, is ultimately to get you to strategic customer collaboration. Uh, ultimately, we think that while today the notion of uh, joint business planning between online retailers or, or sort of hybrid online offline retailers and their, their largest, most sophisticated suppliers is still developing. If you think about some of those models that I described, you know, Amazon.com and its endless aisle philosophy maybe won't have as much emphasis on the right assortment or the right product for, uh, for the dot-com assortment. But as you look at these increasingly relevant, more selective assortments, Prime Pantry, the fresh models from Fresh Direct and Peapod and so on, uh, we believe that there will be increasing demand among retailers for sophisticated, thoughtful, data-driven recommendations about the right assortment, the right price, the right promotions, and the leading manufacturers will be those that have uh, a complete view of not only their own portfolio, but understand how to help each of their retail customers really maximize growth and profitability online. Uh, so I don't think in the, the time that we've got we can give you the entire formula for how to optimize your performance, but we're going to give you a couple of shortcut cuts that I hope are helpful. Uh, and so I've, I've sort of cherry-picked a handful of facets of managing your performance at the digital shelf. This is not the complete picture, but these are a handful of areas that have huge impacts on how you perform. Uh, so we'll start by talking about assortment and availability, which just as in the offline world is really essential to uh, your fundamental performance online. We'll talk about things like product content, and that includes not only the product content that you have direct influence over, your product titles, your images, your descriptions, but equally or maybe more importantly, what consumers say when they rate and review your products, which increasingly is really essential to your new product launch strategies and definitely has implications for offline sales. And we'll talk about your placement because in a brick and mortar environment, we spend a lot of energy on the quality of our real estate, that is, where we're uh, placed in our, our primary shelf position at eye level with the right plan, brand blocking uh, and, and so on, as well as secondary placement. But in an online environment where our products are positioned in search ranking or where our products are positioned within a category uh, or a menu is, is really key. Uh, so with that, let me jump in and, and let's get to it. Uh, I'll, I'll start with assortment and availability because in our opinion, this is sort of uh, a fundamental that has to be addressed uh, at the beginning of your journey to a, a complete and sophisticated strategy for e-commerce. In other words, just as in the offline landscape, you need to know that you've got the right uh, uh, assortment or the right range for a given retailer. You really need to understand uh, what makes sense to have a distribution online. And especially as the economics of these various models I've introduced are getting more challenging in some cases because uh, as the channel matures, you know, the appetite for growth at any cost is diminishing and the urgency to realize a profit is intensifying, we're finding at retailers like Amazon but many other online retailers that uh, the need for suppliers to have a perspective on the right product both from a shopper need and a economic 
sustainability perspective is becoming increasingly important. So this is some anonymized price pack analysis that we did with a confection company who was trying to understand by pack type and by price point uh, among the best-selling products at Amazon, uh, what's the mix look like? And it became pretty abundantly clear pretty quickly that the vast majority of best-selling products were between this $10 and $30 price point in the configuration of a box. Uh, and so very quickly, this this confection company and we were able to compare both the products that were already in distribution from their portfolio at that particular retailer, as well as other products that maybe they had but weren't distributed. And they eventually concluded they were going to introduce some innovation and deliver it directly to that retailer to meet the need that they could see the retailer and their shoppers had. And I, I can tell you that's an increasingly common approach that has a couple of huge benefits, one of which is uh, aligning the products you distribute with the retailer and the shopper's need, as well as minimizing competitive overlap with other retailers. So there's a lot of implications, but it's an increasingly common strategy. Uh, another key point is the, the importance of some of these different programs especially at Amazon, as it relates to how your product sits within the assortment itself. Uh, and I think many of you may be familiar with the Amazon Fast Movers reports that we distribute monthly in uh, many grocery and CPG related categories. If you're not, just go to our, our website, profitero.com, and we've got fresh data that will show you not only the best selling products in your category at Amazon, but some higher level benchmarks in all the areas that I'm describing as well as these programs. And so if you're unfamiliar, uh, Amazon Prime is a $99 annual membership program that's essential to Amazon's growth. It, it is the most successful loyalty and retention model I've seen in retailing over the last 15 years. And there's, there's mounting evidence that it's one of Amazon's fundamental advantages against competitors. Uh, and the reason is that prime households spend between three and five times with Amazon what non-prime households spend. So it's clear when you look at categories like grocery and gourmet food, health and personal care, uh, north of 80%, almost 90% in pet supplies and, and grocery and gourmet food uh, are prime eligible. And so if for some reason uh, you are, are not selling directly to Amazon and your products are not Prime eligible, you're already at a disadvantage. And then there are programs like Subscribe and Save, which have massive implications for the lifetime value of a customer to both Amazon and to a brand manufacturer. Uh, these are subscription-based auto replenishment programs at the product level that give a shopper uh, a modest discount on individual subscriptions, 5% for products uh, one by one, or 15% for households with more than five concurrent subscriptions. And the, the massive benefit to Amazon is those shoppers are then locked in to buying that product in that category from Amazon. And for the brand, while you are funding that discount, you get immense lock-in value and really minimize churn and switching or substitution, which can actually have the effect of not only shifting share to your brand, it can actually expand consumption if you're in an expandable consumption category because you ultimately have more of the product on hand and you, you have certain categories where consumption is expandable or impulse-oriented. And if I see it, at my desk or in my pantry or in my kitchen, then I consume more of it. Uh, and so participation levels in that program range anywhere from uh, the very low end, just a few percent in, in baby, up to almost half of products in health and personal care and grocery and gourmet food. But it's essential to understand the importance of these types of programs at your specific customer in your category. And we see more of these programs being emulated uh, with their own unique twist at other retailers. 
everyone from Sam's Club to Target and others have experimented with versions of this. So you have to pay very close attention. Uh, by the way, I know uh, John mentioned this, but please don't hesitate. If you have questions as I go through this, uh, use the chat window. Happy to, to pause and respond to any questions that anyone has as we continue. Uh, we'll spend we'll spend a minute on stock availability. You know, this has been one of the fundamentals of execution and retailing since the the dawn of uh, of of merchandising, and. Uh, there's very fresh data from the GMA uh, that is, is, I think, instructive and shares that the first time somebody sees a product out of stock, 70% will substitute a different product. And the second time, uh, they will substitute or buy nothing uh, or potentially shop elsewhere. And on the third time, they'll actually switch to a different store. So the issue of on-shelf availability and in, in stock rates has major implications uh, both to the retailer and the manufacturer. And uh, you know, I'm sharing here just a, a simple case study from one of our customers who began monitoring their in-stock availability across retailers uh, and very quickly with visibility into uh, where they had the most profound issues was able to enhance their forecasting and replenishment approach to make sure that they're available and in stock, not only at some of their nationally available retailers, you know, the Amazon.com, but it's essential to be monitoring uh, and managing your in stock availability at a local level. And so you may not have the capacity to uh, measure and manage where you're in stock at every local fulfillment point for a chain that fulfills out of individual stores, but you can certainly uh, improve your performance by paying attention to stock availability and prioritizing based on uh, SKU velocity and metro area and so on. So this is one of the fundamentals you just have to pay attention to. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ratings and reviews because uh, ratings and reviews are, are, as I said, just profoundly impactful. In fact, again, according to Deloitte, uh, just last year, over uh, or just under two-thirds of consumers say that ratings and reviews are important when grocery shopping online. Uh, there's data from Bizarre Voice that emphasizes that the more reviews you have, uh, conversion and sales lift goes up and up. And that threshold really varies depending on your category, which is why we, we encourage you to check out those Amazon Fast Movers reports to get at least a baseline benchmark for the number of reviews that really matters in a general way in your category. Uh, and an even larger percentage of shoppers are reviewing product reviews online before making an online purchase. So especially for new product launches or new brand launches, there's a growing number of shoppers that are in the aisle and before they're willing to try a new product or a new brand, they want to see have others that I trust, those I perceive don't have a paid agenda, my peers uh, as consumers, have they tried this product and do they like it? Uh, so there's a lot that is uh, possible to monitor as it relates to ratings and reviews, but we think it's important to focus on a few things. Uh, the star rating at a high level can give you a sense for uh, perceptions about the product in a very basic sense. You know, there's, there's products that have a, an average star rating below three stars and indexed to your category, that's likely to be a sign of some challenges. Number of reviews is really key, both to uh, driving those initial online conversions, and, and as that bizarre voice data indicates, has big implications over time to your conversion rate, and it also is key to the offline influence. Uh, but one of the things that we find uh, a relatively few number of brands are fully tapping into is the actual text of the reviews themselves and the sentiment of those reviews. It's an incredible source of both shopper and consumer insight because there are, in, in many cases, hundreds if not thousands of reviews at a product level where 
shoppers are, are uh, commenting on both the product itself and specific attributes or characteristics of the product, as well as the experience of buying with a specific retailer. So I don't mean to suggest that this is substituting for more traditional forms of shopper and consumer insight, but it's an incredible supplement to those other forms of learning about attitudes and behaviors as it relates to your shoppers. Keith, I have a question. <clears throat> your stat from uh, Deloitte mentioned online grocery shopping, and the Jupiter one on the bottom um, with the 77%. Uh, was that also specifically or confined to grocery shopping, or was that other kinds of online shopping? The, the Jupiter study was more broad-based, uh, okay. and I've seen data, again, from the same Deloitte study that, that estimates 33% as of September 2014 of grocery sales specifically are influenced digitally. I do recall their methodology was pretty inclusive. So that includes mobile used in the store. It's definitely not specific to ratings or reviews. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, it, it, as a simple way to prioritize where to focus, uh, among your brands or products, even at a category level, we, we would tell you it's helpful to plot uh, where you are positioned in terms of ratings and number of reviews. Uh, and so you can prioritize based on the relative position within your own portfolio, but we think it's wise to look at some of your competitors or best-selling products uh, for context. And so it's instructive when you see products that are below a certain threshold of reviews. We need to incentivize our, our loyalists or advocates, people that have bought our product and are happy about it, to take a minute and review the product at any retailer. Now, at Walmart.com and Amazon, there are programs in place to actually encourage shoppers to review products. Amazon has a program called Vine. Walmart has a program called Trial the Aisle that suppliers can partner with those retailers uh, to send sample products out to shoppers who aren't obligated to review, uh, but understand that uh, because they are established product reviewers, they'll continue to receive free samples. And I would emphasize you absolutely must encourage these reviews to be authentic it's getting easier and easier to parse out which reviews might not be authentic. Uh, but this is a great way to in influence and meet those minimum review count thresholds. And then when you see products that have uh, unfavorable star ratings, we, we help our customers identify those two-star or one-star reviews in real time so that you can respond because those negative reviews really have uh, – an effect on conversion. And if you see your average star rating over time is an issue, you may want to go deeper and do some of the sentiment or text analysis that I described. Uh, and, and so that's where you start to unpack both among positive sentiments and negative sentiments, what are some of the more commonly mentioned topics or themes. Uh, and are they related to the product itself, or are they related to the buying experience? And so with one of our customers in the beauty space, uh, we saw you know, price obviously uh, was a, a very common topic across brands, both our customers' brands and some of their competitors' brands. Uh, and the favorable price at the particular retailer we were studying in this exercise uh, was clearly one of the key reasons why the category was so popular there. But you can see we started to see there were some concerns at a couple of the brands about the texture, the greasiness, the oiliness, and in some cases the fragrance or the scent. Uh, so without building a new panel, without waiting weeks and weeks to field a new study, uh, essentially overnight we were able to help this customer identify some of the challenges both they and their competitors were having with products. And we've seen this type of intelligence end up being 
routed to a customer service team who can respond on the product page itself. We've seen it routed to product development or R&D teams who can use it for uh, new product innovation. Uh, and we've also seen it used by account teams to support uh, joint business planning efforts using the verbatim that come directly from shoppers themselves. In the case of uh, slow delivery, in the case of uh, inaccurate orders and other fairly common issues with a retailer's uh, delivery or, or uh, fulfillment. So we'll talk for a minute about the importance of both search and uh, browsing. And you know it really varies depending on the model, uh, which is more prevalent. Some shoppers uh, have a preference that is they prefer to search or they prefer to uh, click through a hierarchical menu to find the products. On, on average, there's growing evidence that the full basket models like Amazon Fresh, uh, Peapod, Fresh Direct, Walmart Grocery Delivery uh, skew a little bit towards the uh, hierarchical menu, the browse behavior, and the more item-driven national ship models like Amazon.com tend to be heavily dominated by search. Uh, but there's absolutely no question that it is essential to rank as favorably for the right search terms as you possibly can because there's very fresh data from Millward Brown Digital that says when shoppers are searching in their, in their study at Amazon, uh, fewer than one in three shoppers will click past page one. So if you're not on page one, you are uh, essentially invisible. Uh, so it's really important in our view to know first what search terms are people using? What are they looking for? And once you know what people are searching for, then you can pay attention to where you rank for those key terms. Uh, and so what you, what you pay attention to is not only your share of page one, which is a good high-level heuristic, uh, but that's obviously a, a, fact, a function not only of some of the things we'll discuss in a minute. It's a function of how many products you have at that retailer. So if there are 20 results on page one, and you only have six products listed uh, with that retailer, you're never going to get to 100% share of page one search results. Uh, so w once you are paying attention not just to your share of page one, but your position within the rankings, uh, you can start to optimize your product content and really look at a, a wide range of characteristics that have impacts on where you rank in a retailer search results. And th these benchmarks really vary uh, brand by brand, supplier by supplier, but if you're, if you're new to this and you're looking for some rules of thumb, uh, we, we bucket search terms into two big buckets. The first of which is brand terms, that is people are searching for your brand. They're searching for Coca-Cola or Tide or Clorox. And the second of which is uh, generic terms or category terms. They're searching for laundry or cola or bleach. And we, we would love for every brand we work with to have 100% share of searches for their brand uh, on page one. But sometimes, as I mentioned, they don't have enough products and distribution at that retailer to secure that share. And in other cases, uh, from a category perspective, uh, we, we target essentially their fair share of the category across the total market. So if your market share in your category is 30%, not just online share but total market, uh, you want to target 30% or so share of page one results. So uh, we get more precise when we're working with the customer, but that's a way to think about it. And I don't want to suggest for anybody here that uh, we've cracked the, the code on the algorithm at every retailer's search engine across the globe. But we, we absolutely do have pretty sophisticated analytics that help us understand the relative weight of different product content characteristics on 
where a product ranks in search. So this is just an example of some analysis we did across three very familiar retailers for uh, uh, a customer of ours in the cereal business. And you can sort of see, you know, let's assume without revealing who it is, they have about a 30% share of the category across the U.S. Uh, and, you know, at Amazon, they had under a 10% share of page one. Uh, and uh, and that amounted to five products there. Uh, at Walmart, they had just under 30%, so pretty good representation there. And at Target, they had about 15%. Uh, but where things get really interesting is when you don't just know the the what, which is, you know, what's my overall position, it really is essential, we think, to understand why. Because if you don't understand why, you don't know what to do next. And so we helped this particular company analyze things like, is that term serial present in the product's title or in the product's description? And how many images does each product have, both within my own portfolio of products listed at that retailer and among the products on page one? And then, again, things like ratings and reviews. And truthfully, across each retailer, there are as many as 10 different factors that can influence where you rank and search. But, you know, the same way that five or 10 years ago, an entire industry developed around optimizing organic search ranking so that brands could be visible in Google search. There's a, a massive effort underway within CPG, uh, CPG retailing to optimize positioning and placement within retail search. And you need to understand more than just the what. You need to understand why am I not on page one for this term? And once you understand why, you understand what to do next. So the, the importance of search is all about findability. And I want to spend a few minutes now on your product content because product content functions essentially as your digital packaging. So offline, we spend a ton of money on uh, on our physical packaging, we make sure that we've got great representation uh, at the aisle and at the shelf. But online, our products titles, descriptions, uh, images are essential to how we convert. And so uh, when you visit our site to download these materials, uh, there's a playbook of sorts that uh, I don't have time to cover with you today, but it includes some pretty basic uh, things you could do to improve your product titles, your product images, uh, and so forth. And I did just briefly want to share with you uh, some benchmarks, at least for visual content, across a couple of these examples. Because the reality is, you know, where to set your target depends on which retailer you're talking about. And you can see Amazon in the U.S. sort of sets the bar. The average grocery product out of 1,000 we studied at Amazon Fresh has seven products, 100% of which are of a high enough resolution that you can zoom in. Uh, but video is not so important at any of these retailers. Amazon.com, you can see an average of five images. Walmart Grocery, just one image. Uh, so th this is... This is high-level data, but the importance of it is that when you're trying to build a plan for both uh, eliminating defects or deficiencies in your product content and then over time enhancing your product content, you really do need to know, uh, you know what, what's right for each retailer that I'm working with and how, am my, how are my products positioned versus competitors. And so, uh, again, you know, I, I think if you haven't looked at some of the data that we share freely and publicly through these Amazon reports, uh, here's just a couple of highlights from last month's data. You know, the average best-selling grocery product at Amazon has over 2,000 reviews, which is higher than 83% of the categories that we monitor. And it has almost six images on average. So when you're, when you're trying to 
understand where am I starting from, I emphasize, please don't look only at your own internal standards, your own internal benchmarks. You really do need the context of your, your competitive set and best performing product out in the market. Uh, and so just to conclude, uh, th this was a pretty rapid fire run through uh, around a half dozen really important levers that you can pull to impact your performance at the digital shelf. Uh, but I imagine many of you, particularly if you're not directly responsible for the channel, uh, are asking whether you or your company is ready for any of this. Uh, and I would tell you, at this point, around two-thirds of the industry is progressing. Uh, that is, they have a very well-defined and well-articulated strategy for e-commerce that includes capturing their fair share or disproportionate share of the actual dollar volume and growth in the channel as a means of distribution, as well as the importance it plays in influencing brand equity and offline sales. They have people, human resources, either designated or even better, dedicated to supporting the channel in the form of someone responsible strategically, often at headquarters, as well as dedicated account managers at a minimum to support some of the peer players and then people designated within hybrid account teams at Walmart and Target and now maybe Kroger and Hothold to focus on managing the, the online business in parallel to the overarching brick and mortar business. Uh, and they have the tools, the tools ranging from all kinds of uh, product content and digital asset management tools, uh, all sorts of uh, targeting tools uh, for, for digital marketing campaigns and programs, and they are investing in some of the insights and analytics that help them measure and manage the channel strategically the same way that they manage their brick and mortar business and other important growth channels. Uh, now, of the, of the third of the industry that doesn't fit into that progressing uh, uh, cohort, I'd say maybe 10% of the industry are really advanced uh, and a slightly larger percentage, about 20%, are just beginning. Uh, and I, I would tell you, if you think that your company is just beginning, uh, it may feel like this is building gradually, but the growth in e-commerce for CPG is exponential. And there's a great article posted by Chris Dixon in the last 24 hours that explains exponential growth feels very gradual, and then suddenly it feels very sudden. And I think if you are not doing anything, you're on the sidelines today, uh, over the next 18 to 24 months, this is going to feel very sudden. And you're going to have a steeper learning curve for having not gotten started. And you're going to sacrifice a lot of growth and a lot of share to the companies that are already progressing. Uh, and I think you will find uh, the companies that are progressing or advanced now treat as table stakes some of the fundamental metrics and tactics uh, that are traditionally used to manage the channel and specific customers offline in the increasingly important online channel. So uh, as, as last fall, I really appreciate first uh, the, the uh, lead marketing conference for organizing and hosting this event. And uh, I really appreciate everybody for joining us. As I said, you can download the materials from my session, including some additional slides that I didn't share uh, or that I didn't have time to cover. If you just visit blog.profitera.com, you can see the URL here. That's also, our site is also where you'll find those Amazon Fast Movers reports that I mentioned for your categories. Uh, and with that, I, I'm just at the end of my scheduled time. so. I'll let John uh, handle questions. Yes, if we have one question here. Yeah, one question, Keith. Um, traditional tools are well known, 
about how do we gain knowledge of the tools that are needed to develop the e-commerce capabilities within our companies? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the question around tools is an important one. Uh, and I would tell you there's probably three sources, four sources that you can go to, uh, one of which is uh, there are a handful of industry analysts with deep expertise and a, a great horizontal perspective. So companies like Kantar Retail, Retail Net Group, as well as some of the blue chip consultancies uh, have done some diligence around understanding uh, how the, the capability requirements are evolving. Uh, you know, previous, prior to joining Profitero, I spent a huge amount of my energy on that. Uh, and so I, I know firsthand there's some very good, well-documented playbooks around the tools. You also probably have some uh, existing suppliers, uh, you know, companies like Nielsen, companies like IRI, are uh, exploring and investing in ways to enhance their offerings, and so it's it's not a bad idea to check in with them and find out uh, what's new and what's different. Uh, and then you know, think about the different types of intelligence that you need. You you probably want intelligence about your shoppers, which will come from either behavioral panels or self-reported panels. So. You can look at behavioral companies, Comscore, Millwood Brown Digital, those kind of companies, and then there are self-reported panels from companies I've mentioned. Uh, InfoScout is another one. The, the shopper side is one side of it. The second side is retail environment side. Uh, so those are companies like us, and I think you'll hear from others today that are maybe in the same wheelhouse that can give you intelligence uh, about the online retail environment. So what do we see on a retailer's homepage, category page, product page, search result page, offers page? The same way we study the brick and mortar retail environment, we need to study the online retail environment. And then thirdly uh, is actual sales data. And so that is probably the area with the biggest gap at the moment. Uh, you know, 83% of brick and mortar retailers share sales data with their suppliers. It's a much smaller percentage in the online world. So uh, I, I, I'll share the link with anybody that's interested, but at the CPG Data Insights blog and on our blog, I, I shared my outlook for where we're headed as it relates to point of sale data for e-commerce, but that's the big gap that I encourage every manufacturer to sort of pester their, their retailers to share with them.